The sponsoring organizations felt that this was an important story to tell, especially in this centenary year of the passing of the 19th Amendment. We also wanted to consider connections between that history and suffrage and social justice movements today, and our panel will address those things. Before I go into who our partners are, let me give a minute to uh, somebody from AAUW to give just a two-second thing about what AAUW does. AAUW is an organization that's been around since 1881, and we're all about uh, gender equity, uh, e equality for women and girls. Uh, I hope that uh, all of you will consider joining the organization if you're interested in that mission, uh, because we could certainly um, would love to have you. Uh, and I, the one other thing I, I realized on the way over is that today is International Women's Day. So happy International Women's Day to all of you. Okay. Um, Sammy, do you want to say something about Vivian Harsh? <laughs> Would you? Sammy, you got to represent. <laughs> I, I am on the board of the Vivian Harsh Society. My name is Elizabeth Todd Brelay. I'm with Sammy um, Dorch. And the Vivian Harsh Society is an organization um, that's dedicated to preserving and promoting the Vivian Harsh Research Collection at the Chicago Public Library, um, which is the largest um, collection of African-American history and culture in the Midwest. It's at the Carter G. Woodson Library. Um, and so we're happy to be here as part of this today as well. For me and Sammy. <laughs> okay, and I will speak to what Working Women's History Project is. We are an organization that tells the stories of Chicago women who have struggled to achieve rights and benefits for women in the workplace and in other social arenas. We do research on the lives of women, past and present. We sometimes put on performance pieces, showing those stories in a play-like form. We host events at which people can speak about those things, and we publish their stories in pamphlets and in our newsletter. And somebody, Joan Morris outside, has examples of newsletters. If you want to be on our list, it comes out 10 times a year. You can, you can uh, get yourself off it too. You're not stuck if you decide you don't want it. So let me mention we have this event has four partners, each of which has a table. I'm not sure that Rainbow Push has supplied their table yet. Um, and I'll tell you who they are. One is a one partner is this library that has generously donated the space and has provided tremendous help by, by a very knowledgeable librarian, Linda Nauru. Uh, a reason for the library's interest in this program is that their special collections department on the fifth floor has a repository of materials of Chicago's women's organizations that have been part of the fight for social justice. Among others, the Archives of Working Women's History Project is in that collection. So it's a wonderful resource for anyone wishing to conduct research on such organizations. The event's other three partners, um, Ida's Legacy, the League of Women Voters, and Ray Rainbow Push, we consider to be organizations that are continuing the work of the suffragists. It may not be immediately obvious, but each of these organizations, Ida's Legacy, League of Women Voters, Op Rainbow Push, uh, they're all engaged in addressing social injustices surrounding voting, equity, and inclusion of all our citizens. If these concerns are also yours, you can explore something about these organizations and perhaps contribute to their work. They will be staffing the table out, tables outside at the end of this program while we're having dessert. You, so you can talk to them and have dessert. Now, without further, uh, oh, 
the League of Women Voters. I forgot you. <laughs> <laughs> Would you tell us about yourself? Oh, um, gosh. Uh, well, uh, League of Women Voters is now 100 years old. Um, <laughs> Fortunately, doing all of the same things. We're still working to inform right to vote, equity, all of the things that Jackie was just telling us about. Um, on your chair is a uh, bookmark uh, as a sample of some of the voter education we do, and I've highlighted the Illinois Voter Guide. Can I take one minute to say what that is? Thank you. Uh, the Illinois Voter Guide, it's go to that web address, you put in your own address, it pulls up an exact copy of your ballot, and it gives you nonpartisan information on all the candidates, what the jobs are, but also the best thing, and you can mark it and email it to yourself and actually have it. But the best thing about it, it has your, the judges that will be on your ballot. And you can do some research, you know, go to Chicago Votes, go to votejudges.com, or just stay on that site because right there consolidated, it has how the 12 bar associations rank them. That web address will be good for the general, while there'll be even more judges. And I, I make my cheat sheet, which I, of course, share with all my friends, for the judges. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. From Betty Magnus for Rainbow Push. Hi, so Rainbow Push. Rainbow Push has been around for a little over 50 years. We actually started in 1971, and we do some of what Catherine said, and we've been fighting for the right to vote. We fought early on for civil rights, and we just yesterday participated in a press conference that the League of Women Voters and several other organizations have been working with. Reverend Jackson started fighting years ago and got the right for pretrial detainees to register in the jails and they had to vote by mail-in ballot. But as of yesterday was the very first day that pretrial detainees were able to have their own polling place in the jail. They'll be voting. They voted yesterday and today and then next Saturday and next Sunday. Now that is important because many of the people who are pretrial detainees are awaiting trial or waiting to go to court rather for things such as they didn't pay all of their traffic tickets or they owed child support and the bail was $50 and they didn't have it. So it became very important to give people a right to vote and some of those detainees were so excited yesterday to be able to vote because they felt that it was really important so that's some of what Rainbow Push does. We also take teenagers, we do scholarships uh, for college students. We take them on spring tours, which unfortunately we've had to cancel this year because of the coronavirus. We call several colleges and they're closing their campuses to tours for right now. So we're postponing it until July. But we do any number of things. We do construction jobs, uh, our King Breakfast is phenomenal every year where we do scholarships. We have, for example, and I'm going to stop after this, <laughs> um, a partnership with Toyota. So if you are a freshman in, high, in college and you're majoring in engineering, you can apply for that scholarship and they'll give you $25,000 a year plus an internship in the summer and a car and they paid that $25,000 all the way through even if you go to graduate school. That's a scholarship they started with us. And the first four years ends, I think, in 21, and students will be able to apply again for the three years. But we also have a, another partnership scholarship with them where they give $25,000 uh, a year. One time, one time a one-time scholarship of 25000 so, and so. Uh, but that's just an example. Kids need money to go to school, and it's so important, and I just kind of get excited when I talk about kids. <laughs> Thank you. She looks very good. Del do you want to get short? Shorter. Okay. But so we get preview, and then... Okay. 
Good afternoon. So uh, we started Ida's Legacy as the Ida B. Wells Legacy Committee. It's a political action committee. And the whole purpose of it is to support progressive African-American women candidates. And we did this uh, following the 2016 election where 94% of African-American women voted for Hillary Clinton and white women didn't vote for Hillary Clinton. And we saw that that was a pattern from 2008, 2012, 2016, where African-American women, even in the 2000 18 uh, would, or the special election with Doug Jones in uh, the senator from Alabama, black women voted 98%. First time we had a Democratic senator in 25 years from Alabama. So we thought, well, then we need to be carrying our own water. We've carried everybody else's water and it's time for us to carry ours. And we're asking uh, white women to join us instead of us joining them. Uh, much like uh, Ida B. Wells did when she was fighting for suffrage and they told her to get to the back of the line and she said, no, that's not going to happen. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be marching right next to you. So that's the whole purpose of Ida B. Wells' uh, legacy committee is for us to march together to fight for women's rights. And when we brought Hillary Clinton to our first luncheon, she said that African-American women were the moral compass of this country. And if you look the, at the way we vote, we are. Thank you. Okay, someone now, so you know whom to talk to when you leave and go to those tables, you know. Okay, now let me finally introduce <laughs> Marsha Walker McWilliams, who is our speaker. Marsha Walker McWilliams is the executive director of Black Metropolis Research Consortium, BMRC. As BMRC executive director, Marsha provides strategic leadership and operational management for BMRC's activities and for working with BMRC institutions to facilitate the discovery, preservation, and use of black historical collections in Chicago. Marsha received a PhD in American history from the University of Chicago and an undergraduate degree in social policy and African American studies from Northwestern University. She is the author of a wonderful book, I can attest, Reverend Addie Wyatt, Faith in the Fight for Labor, Gender, and Racial Equality with the University of Illinois Press. Marsha is currently working on two forthcoming edited volumes, The Civil Rights Reader and with Tracy Parker and New Histories of Black Chicago with Simone Balto and Eric Gelman. Prior to the BMRC, Marsha taught courses in American History and African American Studies at Lone Star College Prairie View and A&M University, the University of Houston, and Rice University, where she also served as an associate director in the Center for Civic Leadership. Marsha Walker McWilliams. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, as Jackie mentioned, I taught history for several years, so I can get pretty loud. So we shouldn't have any problems <laughs> uh, with you hearing me today. Um, so um, I was asked to come and kind of give a sort of historical overview of African-American women suffragists. Um, so that is what we are going to do for the next few minutes. And typically when there are talks about um, women's suffrage in any moment, that typically starts in 1848 um, with the Seneca Falls Convention and ends right around 1920 with the passage of the 19th Amendment. And I'm here to say that that chronology does not work for black women's suffrage. So we're gonna start a little bit earlier and we're gonna go a lot later um, with that. So if we think about um, sort of African-American women suffragists coming in generations or waves, um, the very first generation of African-American suffragists included women like Sojourner Truth and also Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, um, as you see pictured there. And these women um, were deeply influenced by the anti-slavery movement. So when we start thinking about the ways in which African-American women suffragists were kind of cutting their political teeth, it was through their opposition to slavery. 
And so we have to kind of move a little bit further back than 1848 and really start in the 1820s and the 1830s as the anti-slavery movement was gaining steam. Um, of course, Sojourner Truth was born into slavery and so was able to kind of speak about her own personal experience um, with that institution and the reasons why um, that institution needed to be abolished. These women were, of course, deeply influenced by uh, the anti-slavery movement. And Sojourner Truth, of course, having that experience, Frances Ellen um, uh, Watkins Harper, on the other hand, was born in 1924 in Baltimore into a free household. Um, but she also was very much so active in the anti-slavery movement and was a leader in what was called free produce, in which many um, black women at the time refused to purchase goods that were made on slave labor. So they were not using sugar at all. Um, they were using sort of homespun uh, instead of cotton produced by slaves. And so, um, Harper was very much so involved in that moment. At the same time, this early generation of African-American suffragists often worked within um, white women's suffrage organizations, in part because those were the larger organizations um, and we were not going to see for several years the formation of a sort of national group dedicated towards black women's suffrage or black women's issues. So often they worked within the white women's suffrage movement. This did not mean that it always went well. Uh, in fact, there was quite a bit of tension um, that happened as a result of um, black women trying to work within those channels. And part of what both Sojourner Truth and Frances um, Harper did was consistently talk about what was often referred to um, as the double cross. These days, we might think of it as a sort of idea of intersectionality, that people come from a space of a sort of a race, a class, a gendered background. But back in the 19th century, uh, black women often referred to this as the double cross or the dual burden of race and sex. So when they went into these organizations that were dominated by white women, they were often talking about the ways in which they were experiencing dual oppressions. That yes, they could sort of understand the ways in which their gender impacted them um, and sort of kept them from the vote and from suffrage, but that there was also the impact of racism. Um, that needed to be addressed and was often not addressed um, by white women in the suffrage movement. So the big shift, of course, for any of you that are familiar with um, women's suffrage within the United States history is what happens around the 15th Amendment, um, which is a Reconstruction Amendment that was um, geared to give black men uh, the vote, um, but not any women. And so there's a great divide that happens um, in the late 1860s around this issue, where many um, white suffragists were debating whether or not the 15th Amendment should include universal suffrage, which would mean suffrage for everyone, men and women, versus what the 15th Amendment was, was sort of known as Negro suffrage, that it would just um, provide suffrage for uh, black men. And so this shift was so contentious within the women's suffrage movement that they actually split into two different organizations. So there's the National Women's Suffrage Association, which sort of opposed um, the 15th Amendment or Negro suffrage solely. And then there was also the American Women's Suffrage Association, very different names, by the way, um, which supported the 15th Amendment. And many African-American women gravitated towards the American Women's Suffrage Association in part because they were supporting the 15th Amendment and seeing that if anyone within the African-American community were granted the extension of the right to vote, that was considered a win. Now, this didn't mean that they were not still fighting for women's suffrage and did not see that as something that they should fight for. And often it was very difficult for African-American women suffragists who were sort of pegged um, in this way that they only cared about race issues and did not care about what was considered um, women's issues or women's suffrage at the time. And that's just not true. In fact, black women were kind of balancing those needs um, in some really kind of adept ways. One of the things that's often sort of left out of this discussion, um, is particularly this period of right during Reconstruction, is the impact that black women had on um, voting in the South. 
And typically, if you read a lot of political narratives, because women did not have the right to vote, it's almost seen as if they were apolitical, that their actions, that their organizing did not matter. And that could not be further from the case. Black women were very um, instrumental in um, sort of Republican circles within the South. They were known to carry guns to the polls to protect black men so that they were able to vote. They were known to turn voting into a full day long celebration where folks were coming out, bringing food, they were dancing, they were singing. And this was sort of seen as a communal triumph. Even though they themselves did not have the right to vote, they definitely celebrated the fact that someone, um, men in their community had that right to vote. And so they showed out in droves to um, state Republican um, association meetings and were trying to sort of influence in the ways that they could, even though they didn't have the vote, they showed up, they took space, they took seats and made sure that they were visibly present. Uh, and they also were impacting the votes of men. It was not uncommon for black women in the South to say, if you vote Democratic, you're gonna have a problem in this household. <laughs> because during this time period, the Democratic Party was seen as the party of white supremacy. And so many African-Americans gravitated towards the Republican Party. And so black women were, were very instrumental in making that preference um, known. And to kind of highlight this a little bit more, the sort of tensions that you would see um, around the sort of 15th Amendment and the Reconstruction Era, I wanted to read a quote from um, Charlotte uh, Fortin Grimke. And she wrote to the Washington Post uh, in the late, in about 1898. And she talked about the reasons why it was so difficult for African-American women to find a space within white women's suffrage organizations. So Charlotte Ford and Grimke wrote to the Washington Post in 1898 regarding an upcoming um, women's suffrage meeting. And she stated, these expressions at suffrage meetings have for years prevented many of us from attending the conventions held in this city. They have disgusted us. I do not hesitate to say that they can only be characterized as contemptible, for their direct effect is to strengthen a most unjust and cruel prejudice, to increase the burdens which already weigh so heavily upon a deeply wronged people. And while African-American women appreciate the value of women's suffrage quite as keenly as other women do, they will never cease to rejoice that their fathers and brothers and sons and husbands have the right to vote conferred upon them. And we would desire for ourselves no recognition that would involve injustice to such men. So black women were in this position in which they were certainly for women's suffrage, but they were not about to deny the benefits that could come from black men having suffrage um, as well. And Charlotte Ford and Grimke is also interesting because she starts to sort of um, resonate with another wave of African-American women suffragists. So we kind of go from this first generation to the second generation. And some of these women might be a little bit more familiar to you. So Ida B. Wells, um, Mary Church Terrell, Fannie Barrier Williams, Nanny Helen Burroughs, and many others. These women were considered the kind of second generation of African-American suffragists. Many of them were born in the um, 1850s and 1860s. Many of them were born free, so they were not um, dealing with sort of a history or vestige of enslavement. And a number of them um, were also born after the Civil War. So their assumptions or ideas about needing to necessarily start conversations about suffrage from within the white women's movement were not there. They were definitely on a different trajectory in terms of how they were going to organize for black women's suffrage. And they publicly challenged tokenism and racism in the white women's suffrage organizations. Unlike Francis um, Harper, who sort of worked within those channels of those movements, these women said, no, we will form separate organizations if we need to in order to be heard and to have leadership. And they publicly took to task women like Frances Willard, um, who was very instrumental in the Women's Christian Temperance Union, and said, if you are not speaking up against things like lynching, then you are not really supportive of what is happening to African-American women and their families across the country. They lambasted um, white women suffrage organizations for maintaining what were called separate associations or separate 
unions, whereby African-American women were not allowed to join sort of integrated units to fight for suffrage at the local level. And so really these women were much more vocal about the need to sort of have a separate and distinct African-American voice in the suffrage movement. This kind of culminates um, in the founding of many organizations, one of which was the National Association of Colored Women in 1896, which was really the first national um, organization that would speak to black women's issues and also provide a sort of unified venue for suffrage um, organization. And so thinking about um, this new generation of African-American um, women suffragists, it's also important to think about the local level. Often when we think about the 19th Amendment, we think about, okay, now women are voting in federal elections. But the truth of the matter is that many states had enacted state voting laws that allowed women to vote prior to 1920. Uh, and you're gonna see a lot of that start to happen, especially in Northern states, in part due to the Great Migration, where many more African-Americans are leaving the South, they're coming to urban centers in the North, and a lot of those urban machine politicians are saying, hey, we need those votes. And so if we can give black women, women the vote as well, that means they're gonna be able to sort of organize in those areas and get more political support. And so that's exactly what happens um, in states like Illinois, where you had the Alpha Suffrage Club, which was formed just a year after women were given the right to vote in the state of Illinois. Ida B. Wells was um, influential in this club as well. And this club is credited with doing quite a bit of organization to bring Oscar DePriest as the first black alderman in Chicago. And then later, of course, he moves into the national political realm. Um, there's also the election of Mayor Bill Thompson um, that is also sort of heavily, you know, I, I see you laughing, Jackie, we can laugh about that one. Um, <laughs> but that is also um, where black women in the state of Illinois are given credit for sort of mobilizing um, in Republican circles. And um, again, the, the 19th Amendment kind of looms within this conversation, but we often forget that it was not a given that black women were necessarily going to be included in discussions about the 19th Amendment. In fact, across the South, many state senators and legislators were trying to find ways where they could say, okay, we're okay with giving white women the right to vote, but not black women. So how can we kind of write them out of this amendment in order to ratify it? So there was a huge amount of controversy around whether or not um, the sort of larger women's suffrage movement was really going to come to the defense of and fight to ensure that all women would be included. It was really kind of touch and go, um, mostly across the South. And I say this to say that the 19th Amendment was not necessarily a watershed for all women because not all women had the right to vote. Did it certainly pave the way in federal elections? Sure. But we often forget that many folks of color, black folks in the South, even though they were enfranchised, and after 1920, black men and women all had the right to vote, they were often kept from doing so because of white supremacist organizations, right? The Democratic Party in the South, you had the Red Leagues, the, um, was it the Red Leagues? It's the White Leagues or the Red Shirts? I don't know. <laughs> You get my gist. Uh, Ku Klux Klan, other organizations that, again, sort of necessitated the fact that when blacks were able to go to the polls, they did have to carry guns and arms in order to do so. So it was not a given that all women were actually going to be able to exercise the right to vote. The 19th Amendment sort of provides that on paper, but the actual act of being able to do that, being able to have a political say, was not a given. So again, when we think about black women's suffrage, we really do have to pay attention, right, to the context of these moments because it doesn't necessarily mean that all women were given the right to vote. Um, regardless of this, black women still found ways to impact elections and to impact the political arena. They used the black press to um, provide voter education, much in the ways that the League of Women Voters does and talks about how you vote, how you understand what candidates' records are. Black women were doing the same things in the pages of the black press and saying, for those of you who can vote, here is how you do it. Here are the meeting spaces where you can learn to become sort of political citizens. 
They also supported candidates for office, including black women um, and white women as well, who were running for local and state offices. Um, they continued to protest disenfranchisement and they would often wear Republican buttons, even though doing so in the South could target them for violence, could target them for retribution from employers. They continue to have a very sort of active um, political voice. But there were also some changing seas in the national political landscape. The Republican Party certainly recognized the organizing power of black women. And they often called on the National Association for Colored Women to help them around the time of elections, saying, hey, can you get out and organize and form these block clubs and form these local parties to help Republican candidates win? But often after that, when black women were saying, okay, we helped you get into office, now what about these other issues that are plaguing our communities? Silence. And so black women were understanding that their sort of political work was not always coming with the same uh, returns. That they were often asked to be on the front lines of organizing, but not necessarily receiving the benefits um, of that organizing. Now, most sort of mainstream suffrage lectures will end around the 19th Amendment. They'll talk about women getting the right to vote. They may talk about the first women entering Congress and women in state and local elections. But the fact of the matter is that even after the 19th Amendment, black women, many of them in the South, were unable to vote. So their suffrage movement continued well beyond 1920 and some would argue continues into this day. So again, when we're thinking about um, the sort of role in the work of black women, we have to kind of extend our notion of what a suffragist means. Because I would very much so argue that the women you see here were black suffragists, much in the same vein of an Ida B. Wells, right? Of a Mary Church Terrell. These were black women fighting across the South and specifically in the state of Mississippi with the formation of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party in 1964. African Americans were kept from the polls from a variety of reasons. It could be intimidation, it could be things like the poll tax, the literary literacy test, all of which come into being during the period of Reconstruction and keep a large amount of black folks out of um, voting and also running for political office in the South. So if we're thinking about what it means to be a suffragist, these women fit that category. And we could probably talk in many ways about how there are women today who are fighting against the repeal of portions of the Voting Rights Act that comes in 1965, in part because these women are calling so much attention to um, the disenfranchisement of black voters in the South. So I want to um, sort of leave with some key lessons to think about um, African-American women suffragists. Um, and some of this, of course, might kind of bleed over into the panel, so I wanted to kind of cut my remarks short. The first is that um, African-American suffragists spoke to the ways in which race and gender impacted their lives and political voices. Often again, black women are seen as, oh, well, they're only concerned about race issues. They're not concerned about the woman question or women's issues. And that's not true. The ways in which black women organized was specifically regarding the context of their lives. They understood the ways in which race and gender negatively impacted their right to vote and other aspects of their life. So because they organized in different ways, they're not always given the due that the sort of mainstream women's suffrage movement is given. Black women had to find ways to negotiate both because they couldn't just speak to one or the other. So when we're thinking about African-American suffragists, we have to keep that relationship in mind. We'll also say that African-American women suffragists employed a variety of strategies, not just to seek the vote, but also to have some impact on politics in ways that were formal and informal. We're only looking at voting, and voting for sure is important, we're missing some of the key organizing that happens around politics in African-American communities because that happens through fundraising. That happens through thinking about the vote, not necessarily always as an individual, but as a collective. That you are voting not only for yourself, but voting for what is best for your community. And that is a key um, aspect to sort of think about um, with African-American suffragists. Um, and again, their impact on the political landscape of the nation, 
There are many, many elections uh, that have been close in this country, but that African-American women have helped to sort of push one candidate to the fore. And that happens over and over again, right? Um, you were, um, I think it's Delmarie, uh, you were talking about the importance, right? The numbers, the percentages of black women who have consistently sort of turned out over the years. And they continue to do so even without always having or reaping the benefits of that. And so it's important to understand what those political motivations are, right? It definitely shows adept organizing skills, but it also shows a commitment to a process that hasn't necessarily provided the gains and the benefits. So when you're thinking about kind of democracy in that way, it's really important to sort of center um, African-American suffragists within that conversation. And I would also argue that as long as sort of racism and sexism form barriers to true democracy, you are going to continue to have African-American suffragists. They are not in the past. They are very much so in the present because these particular issues continue um, to impact the ways in which democracy plays out in this nation. Um, so that is what I have. Are there any questions? So we have um, just the, probably can take just maybe one or two questions so we can get to the panel. Um, but please feel free to ask if you have anything. You were very clear. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's my teaching hat, right? <laughs> yes. You know, at one point, African Americans basically were supported in the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. What did the switch happen? Mm -hmm. What now, mm -hmm. what now is Democratic went to the yeah. Republican I feel this both one and the same somewhat, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. You still have the same problems no matter what party you go to. Yeah. So does it really matter? Yeah. Well, there are definitely folks who are in that camp. Um, but to answer the, the first part of your question, the switch starts to happen with the Great Depression and Roosevelt and the New Deal. Uh, many Republicans around that time are not necessarily speaking to the issues of African Americans. And like my grandmother would say, you know, the thing that she recognized about the Depression that was different was just that now white folks were in the line, you know, needing help because she said they were always there. But how she knew something was different was that now she was seeing her white neighbors also in that same space. So for many African Americans, they felt like this had been the kind of status quo, especially in parts of the South and Mississippi where my people are from. Um, and so they were looking toward the Republican Party in part because they had been doing all this organizing to say, well, what are you going to do? Uh, and from the White House on, there was very little about that. And so once FDR came in with the New Deal, despite all of his issues, and that's a whole other lecture, um, African Americans started to say, well, at least there's something here and someone is trying to do something about the economic problem. So that shift starts in the 30s where more African Americans start to vote Democratic. And by the mid 1960s, that's when you sort of see the complete flip where many African Americans after 1968 are officially voting as Democratic. So it's been pretty recent. And for longer parts of our history, we were actually voting Republican. All right. Yes. The first time I ever voted, I voted for John F. Kennedy. <laughs> and Blacks were voting for Kennedy. Yeah, so yeah, it definitely starts in the 30s. Um, and there are more Blacks voting for Kennedy in the 60s. But there are also still a sizable portion of African Americans who are voting Republican. But by the time 68 comes around, Lyndon Johnson, you see that shift is kind of more complete um, along those lines. Right. Okay. So if there are no other questions, I guess we will turn it back over to Jackie for the panel. So we will now have the panel. I will introduce our moderator and the panelists will speak and introduce themselves. Uh, our moderator is going to have to move her chair and put it on. <laughs> okay, this is a self-help event. Okay, so our moderator, and can you hear me? Yes, is Elizabeth Todd Breland. Elizabeth Todd Breland is an associate professor of history at the University of Illinois at Chicago, namely this institution. 
She received her PhD from the University of Chicago. Her research and teaching focus on US urban history, African American history, the history of education. Her work also explores interdisciplinary issues related to racial and economic inequality, urban public policy, neighborhood transformation, education policy, and civic engagement. Her book, A Political Education, Black Politics and Education Reform in Chicago Since the 1960s, analyzes transformations in black politics shifts in modes of education organizing, and the racial politics of education reform in the 1960s to the present. She is one of only 30 international education scholars to be selected as a 2016 National Academy of Education Spencer Postdoctoral Fellow. Professor Todd Breland's writing has appeared in the Journal of African American History, Souls, and scholarly edited volumes. She has also contributed to popular outlets, including NPR, ESPN, The Washington Post, and local radio, television, print, and online media. As of June 2019, Professor Todd Greeland serves on the Chicago Board of Education and because she was appointed by Mayor Lori Lightfoot. On a personal note, we had Elizabeth Todd Breland speak at one of our events, Working Women Did, a number of years ago. So would Elizabeth, with her chair, come up here? We have four mics that are going into CAN TV, so you all will have to do a little sharing. And would the panelists come up? And so everybody comes up. Yeah, everybody comes up. So welcome you all again to UIC. Um, I'm going to let our panelists do a bit more to talk about um, themselves, but I'll quickly tell you who they are as we get started. And I also want to thank Marsha for really setting the table nicely for the panel discussion that we're about to have. <laughs> um, so we have Asia Butler, the Executive Director of the Resident Association of Greater Inglewood. Uh, we have Delmarie Cobb, who spoke earlier as well, um, the founder and president of Ida's Legacy. We have Ivy Hart, the women's business development manager of the, in, in, for the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity. And we have Ann Jamison, who is the president of the League of Women Voters of Chicago. So as part of maybe just saying a little briefly, a little bit more about um, your work to get us started, I'd also like you, because we all just sat here at, at the foot of Marsha. Um, if you have any sort of just immediate reaction uh, as well to what, what you heard um, today. Well, I'll go first. <laughs> Only because it ties into what um, Ida's legacy is about. And, and what I had said earlier about working together, that we have to work together, black women and white women. And that's one of the things that you it's still a problem, uh, and you see it all the time. And one of the reasons why I formed Ida's Legacy was to say that if we're going to lead at the polls, then we should be leading in terms of how the issues are being framed. And we're not doing that. And I always use this one example as an example of us not doing it, and that is you often hear white women say that black that a woman makes 79 cents for every dollar a man makes well black women make 64 cents to every dollar a man makes and brown women make 63 cents for every dollar a man makes so why are we talking about 79 cents <laughs> so we need to frame the issues and not just follow along and let other people frame the issues but then we're the ones setting the the, setting the standard by voting. And so that was the reason why I formed Ida's Legacy, and it ties into what you were saying. Plus, I've been a political consultant for the last 30 years, and I see it on a on a one-on-one -on -one basis every day of my life, and it's the biggest disappointment I have is that we do what we're supposed to do, but we don't hold anyone accountable after we go to the polls and, and vote. I, uh, hello. <laughs> I think my initial reaction was um, in those 20 minutes, I learned more than <laughs> I learned in a history class throughout high school and, and college. And it's a story that I'm just so glad and thankful to hear. Um, I just didn't know. 
I, I knew about the white women's movement and some of the African-American women that worked with it, but not as deeply mm -hmm. as you eloquently talked about today. So it was just really a, a aha moment, a wow moment. And I really appreciate the way that you broke that down. I think for me, it was um, interesting how historically black women are forgotten. Um, but there's just so much work that's being done. Um, and that ties into what my current job is as well as my personal job. So my current job is that I oversee all the women-owned businesses in the state of Illinois. Um, but when you look at the, the metrics, so um, my office is oversees the economy and then we have a minority office and then I focus on women. But when you look at the metrics, certified is 900 women, 749 of them are white women business. So there's a, there's a gap. <laughs> There's a huge gap. Um, so pushing um, the governor's office and the agenda that, yes, I'm going to advocate for women-owned businesses, but specifically creating pipelines and mentorship and businesses for women-owned businesses that are also women of color um, and getting them certified. And um, we, need to, we need to change that statistic. Um, so that's my job, my nine to five. And then on the side, um, I run Heart for Change, which is my consultant business, working on black women specifically who come out of college and helping them in the professional life, but also politicizing what they do. Um, so everything you do, in my opinion, as a black woman is political. Um, and helping those women understand their voice is important and how do we get to their passions. Um, so yeah, that's, it really just reminded me that there's so much that's forgotten and until we speak up and fight back, that's how we create the legacy. Hi. Um, I think my initial reaction was very similar to all of your guys's. I was thinking a lot about how Del Delmarie said, um, we're offering a chance for white women to come and work with us because historically speaking, like when black women have led, it's always worked out better for everyone. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's something that I was thinking a lot about, like while, we, while I was hearing about the history and again, learning more than I learned in any history class. <laughs> Um, and thinking about like how these stories have been forgotten for so long and pushed to the side in favor of uh, white women's stories and how we need to recenter that and think more about all this work that is still ongoing and there's still disenfranchisement happening. And how can we meet black women where they are and work together on these issues that uh, everyone faces, but when you come to the crux of that, race and gender, it is amplified so much more, so. Thank you. Uh, well, sort of building on that, that was an excellent segue. Um, as you all look to the future regarding um, sort of what you see as the future direction of social justice work, surrounding issues of voting, surrounding issues of civic participation, where do you see that work going moving forward? Likewise with the women's rights movement more generally, what is the future direction that you see? of the sort of future of this work that we've been talking about today. And you can relate it to your the, the work that you all do in communities as well. So for me, in Ingl so I do work in Inglewood. I have an association called the Resident Association of Greater Inglewood. Um, there's about 13 of us who founded it about 10 years ago, majority women. Um, but we have a variety of members and dem our demographics. There's everyone from the community. However, um, the landscape of Inglewood now currently really have a lot of strong women leaders. Um, we have one of the youngest aldermen, Stephanie Coleman of the 16th Ward. Mm -hmm. We now have another alderman woman, um, Jeanette Taylor of the 20th Ward. And one of our members, um, Sonia Harper, who did a, who is definitely a sufferer, <laughs> if I'm pronouncing it right, she's done so much political work to get people voting and education. And we did very similar things from the 1800s where we did barbecues outside and just made voting and the education of voting a fun process, right? Um, not just for elections, just for our voice to be heard because we have one of the lowest turnout um, in the city of Chicago. And so now to see them um, doing that work, but now our legislators um, in Springfield and now a city council um, just really shows just the power of women and women leadership. And so we're all there in Inglewood supporting them. And they're still 
root it and organize it because at the end of the day, that's the work. It just depends on which level you do the organizing. So for us, it really hits home for Inglewood because people always say our community is ran by women anyway. (laughs) Uh, We just have to be heard, um, which is why our landscape is um, still and and much, much need of improvement um, because that voice is not heard um, because we are women. So we just have to be a little louder. Well, um, one of the things that Ida's Legacy emphasizes is much like the women's groups that that say they're pro-choice. So for me, being progressive is as important as being pro-choice. And people are using that word so much now that I'm almost thinking I've got to find another word uh, because I know a lot of people who are using it are not progressive. And, and it's just that it's the, it's, the, it's the end thing to say. But as someone who's been progressive all my life and been fighting against the establishment all my life, um, that is an important word. And it's important because, again, white progressive issues and black progressive issues are not always the same. And we have to understand that. For instance, and I'll give you an example. Again, pro-choice. So a lot of the women's groups wanted the city of Chicago to cut funding to all the hospitals that wouldn't allow birth control or abortion. Well, I'm not, you know, that for me is navigating that. I am definitely pro-choice. But when you look at the hospitals in the black community, St. Bernard, Mercy, St. Anthony, they are Catholic hospitals and they're in the heart of the city and they're in the heart of the hood and their clientele are black people and poor people. So we're gonna cut off our noses despite our faces over one issue? So that means navigating that and us having a say on that issue and that's where we're not coming together. It's our way or no way. We're for pro-choice and we say don't fund them. Nobody talks to us and say, well, how does that affect your community? So those are the fights that we are in on a daily basis, and we have to sit down and work together and figure out how do we navigate this so that everybody comes out a winner, not just one group comes out a winner who isn't going to be adversely impacted. So those are the things that I'm fighting for every day. And, and when I use the word progressive, I, I, I want to be clear all the time that how progressive affects you and how progressive affects me is very different. Um, I think for me, this I had to think about the question. Um, it's been a hard week for me thinking that I don't have any black option to vote for. I don't have a woman to vote for. Um, And so the hope part of it was hard for me this week. But I think that when I think about, and I've worked with young women for a really long time. So I actually went to law school only to represent children. So I really believe in the youth and the future generation. Um, And when I think about the youth that I talk about, they're very clear on what's going on. There's no confusion about party politics, no confusion about how the system Um, adversely impacts them. Um, And I have people who will straight up call me out and just say, I'm a womanist, I'm not a feminist. They will say to me, you know, here are the books you need to read, here are the new works of young people writing things that are rewriting their history books in schools. Um, So I think my hope comes in listening to the youth and the things that are gonna come. Um, There's just so many really smart and wise people who are fighting. And like you said, suffrages are, are happening now. They're being born today. So that's where my hope for the future lays. Um, can I quote you on that suffragists are being born today? Because I want to use that in everything now. Because <laughs> that was amazing and I love it. I'm just going to sit up here and cry a little bit. Um, don't mind me. Uh, so I think like when I when I think a lot about like what you guys are saying and when it comes to like working towards the future, um, that one of the things that is so important is acknowledging the privilege that like I'm a white woman. Spoiler alert. Um, uh, and acknowledging like that privilege that I have had growing up um, where like I can I could have expected, you know, my grandfather got the GI Bill, went to college and created a middle class family that sent 
two daughters to college that then uh, one of those daughters sent two daughters to college um, and acknowledging that not everyone was able to have that story mm -hmm. and not everyone still is able to have that story. And when going forward, um, especially like the League of Women Voters, we do a lot of really great work. We do still have our struggles with our racial diversity. Mm -hmm. And when thinking about how to move forward, I think it's so important to acknowledge where we're coming from and to then meet people where they are mm -hmm. and to say, I don't necessarily understand. I can read as many books as I want, mm -hmm. but I will never yeah. understand that like lived experience yeah. and to create an environment where you, other people can share their experiences and not feel like they're being shut out. So, so I have lots more questions, but this will be my last one before I open it up to audience questions and participation. Um, but I'm curious, it is sort of a two-party, you can take either or both parts of it. One is, do you think there are ways that knowing the stories of African-American suffragists, those like those we just heard, can be mobilized in our current political organizing environment. And then related to that, can you recommend some steps that those of us who are here today can take to continue that legacy and to continue that work? Practical steps, perhaps. Um, so I think that um, word of mouth is incredibly powerful. So telling your friends the stories, telling your children the stories, telling your husbands, anywhere you're going, speaking about these stories is really, really powerful. Um, like I think about when I was studying Ida B. Wells, um, so I, I've been a teacher, I lasted six months because CPS is crazy. Um, but um, Ida B. Wells was also a teacher. Um, and she lost her job standing up for what was right. Lost her job. A lot of us aren't willing to lose our jobs. I don't know if I am. Um, so just really thinking about that. Um, and then she moved forward from that. And then you know the lynchings happened and then she went to the South to journal, be a journalist about them. Um, that's amazing. And I think if more young women knew about these stories, it would empower them to do things. So I think that telling the stories, learning the stories, because I could say I've only really studied Ida B. Wells. So even today I learned something and taking intentional time to learn those stories and then spreading them. I'll talk. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it says a lot that we're up here saying we learned more in the last 20 yeah. minutes than in a history class. And it says a lot about like yeah. what our education sort of prioritizes. So I think there's a lot that we can do with these stories and go out and telling people and sort of making people more enthusiastic that like so one of my very first memories was my mom taking me to vote with her mm. she you know bundled me up in the little stroller and took me to the polling place and I sat at her feet while she voted and on her way on our way home she told me the stories of suffragists like that was one of my first memories is my mom telling me mm. um how Alice Paul refused to eat in I was like three uh oh, Alice Paul God. refused to eat in jail and they force fed her and yeah. Uh, so like that was something that was always drilled home for me in my in my home was people have fought for this. And the fact that it's like people are still fighting for this. Um, and that's something that especially like white people can forget about because yeah. we've we just have we've had it for a while. And the fight for us kind of ended after the 19th Amendment. Like obviously, like we kind of didn't do our due diligence on helping other people. But like when people think of it as, oh, this is the past, not now and the future, they can they can kind of put it in a book and put it on a shelf and be like, I studied this in school and I'm done now. Um, but when we think about bringing those stories to the people now mm -hmm. and say, you know, Ida B. Wells refused to stand up uh, and get out of a car in a train and was thrown off of the train like years before Rosa Parks did it. Um, and to bring those lessons to today, I think that's a really a really like moving thing that people can, can latch on to. Can I piggyback real quick over that? You just remind me of a story. Um, and I think that I forget, this is great because I forgot even why I got into like voting in democracy. And I remember I work on a lot of campaigns because I'm also a political consultant. And there was a woman, I was calling people to get out the vote for Jeanette Taylor actually. And there was a woman who can't walk, doesn't have family and was in our house. And she was like, I can't get there, but I have to vote. Ida B. Wells did this, 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 and this. And I didn't know, I knew about Ida B. Wells, but I hadn't studied her yet. 
And she was like, I can't get there, I can't get there. She was so upset that she couldn't vote. And so I ended up getting a bunch of people to go and get her and we, we rolled her to vote. And that's when I, I really understood like Ida B. Wells is an important person. This person needed, like, she was so upset. Um, so this just reminds me that even that impacted me to further learn. <laughs> well, I was going to say, I was going to uh, bring it back to what we just saw last week with Super Tuesday. And you saw, and, and I was interviewed a lot this week about black women voting or black people voting, period, and how they were going to vote. And I said, black people are relational. We're not transactional. And so that means that, you know, if you have a relationship with us, you may get our vote. If you pop up and, went and got out of bed and said, I'm going to run for president today, you may not get our vote. In all likelihood, you won't. And we saw that. And, and even with Bernie Sanders, even last time, he knew the black vote was his, his uh, Achilles heel. But he really didn't do anything because the black vote is still his Achilles heel. heel. So he did not understand the need to further that relationship because he blew it off by saying we're conservative. Black women are not conservative for the most part, or black people, we may be pragmatic, but we're not necessarily conservative. And so what you see is you have to have a relationship with our community, and that's the best way for us to get the word out about voting. If you remember, uh, I think the last election, there was a judge who we knocked off. It was the first time a judge had been knocked, not voted for retention ever. And it came out of relationships. It became such an issue in the community that everybody was talking about it. Everybody was emailing it. Everybody was doing, these are the things you need to do. We don't do enough of that for each other. We need to do it more. We saw people do it for Barack Obama. We saw people do it for Coughlin. But we should not, it should not just be against somebody. It should also be for somebody, and we should do it all the time, not just when we feel that we're pressured into it or somehow we want to make a statement, but the statement we want to make is all the time. Yeah. Martin Luther King said uh, politics is about who much, who, how much, who gets what and how much, meaning that your vote should be equivalent to what you get back. Well, we qu clearly aren't getting anything back for our vote. And so that's why, as relationships, we've got to start holding people accountable collectively, yep. not just one person doing it or one group doing it, but all of us doing it to actually make a difference. If we, wanna, if we want to be uh, a legacy, uh, Ida B. Wells or Fannie Lou Hamer or any of them, we must hold people accountable. Yep. The power of storytelling uh, can really connect a lot of the things that we're talking about today. Um, when I look at Betty, I think about my grandmother mm -hmm. and their work at PUSH and me listening young to these stories mm -hmm. that she was involved in and, and standing up for. And we don't have the opportunity, and I'm looking out in the room, to hear some of these stories mm -hmm. from our elders. We're in this fast information, social media world that a story lasts for 15 seconds on Instagram and it's gone. And we lose really where we're rooted from without those stories. And so the movements that happened in the 1800s, the 1900s, 1960, 1970, 2000, even today, needs to be more conversations and talks about them and let those folks like that lady who couldn't get out to vote, what is her story? What do she know? And how do we use information and technology to really capture those stories and get those out to a lot of our young women warriors? I think about my daughter, she's at Spelman, she's graduating this year, and she told me the same thing. She said, I'm not a feminist, I'm a womanist. Mm -hmm. And I was like, whoa, okay. <laughs> and, and I was so proud of her that she had this pride already and this mm -hmm. sisterhood already. And I'm, I'm fortunate that she's getting that history at Spelman, but it's just not enough of it. Um, and it doesn't have to be formal. It can just be in the kitchen of your grandmother or grandmother on the block to hear what did she know 
Mm -hmm. Um, And I I try my best to do that. I was doing that yesterday with some elders from Inglewood. And I hear about all their fight and energy they had over issues that still are here today. And it's just a torch that keeps being passed. But if we don't know what sparked that torch, um, sometimes we could be misguided with our work. So I think those stories are very powerful. and We need to figure out ways that we can really cultivate them. As a historian, please. <laughs> <laughs> Stories are very powerful, um, so I really appreciate that. When you were talking about Super Tuesday, the last thing I'll say before I open it up here is, I think the other thing to the larger point that's been made here is that the fight for suffrage is ongoing, mm-hmm. right? I mean, I think seeing the lines in places like Texas, people waiting six, seven hours to vote in a primary, um, and the fact that there we have we do not continue to see that as an imminent crisis um, speak to what some of the things Marsha was talking about earlier as well in terms of the moving backwards from the Voting Rights Act in terms of these sort of regressive policies that are not it's not just about suppression as a broad thing but actually erosion of the laws and policies that were put in place to explicitly do something about that that these folks we've been talking about were fighting for um, so we have some time for questions if folks in the audience. Uh, want to ask our panelists anything here today? Yeah, I'm a little excited to see how far this stretches. <laughs> or I can just repeat. You want me to repeat the question? Sure. Okay. Go ahead. I'd like to know how we can all continue to be together. Mm-hmm. You know, this is obviously a very powerful group of women, and there are many more. But how do we continue this energy? So the question was, how do we continue the energy? How do we continue to be together? Um, in spaces like this, mm-hmm. or others in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> That's a Jackie question. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to answer that? I'm just feel now that more white women and and black women are working together, or do we still feel those separation? Do you feel that we're coming together more, or we're staying where we are now? I think that that's been an ongoing problem. I mean, there is a lack of sisterhood uh, between white women and black women. And it's been an ongoing problem. I mean, uh, Ida B. Wells was certainly uh, an example of that. Uh, Here she was fighting for women to get the right to vote, and yet people were telling her to still get in the back of the line. And, but she was getting it from men and women. So the men were telling her to get to the back of the line, and the, women, and the white women were telling her to get to the back of the line. So she was not a popular figure, understand that, that she was not a popular figure because she was not asking permission. She was doing what she thought was right. And any woman who does not ask permission is never going to be popular. Um, <laughs> believe me. Uh, and so it's still the same, it has not changed. And, And I don't know, I mean, believe me, I've been working on it and I still see it uh, as the same. Uh, I know that as a political consultant, I've I've done things for Emily's List, for instance, and um, never had a relationship though with Emily's List. Even though I've been out here forever, there's never been a relationship. It's been on a transactional basis. And so that's why I know, because I pose this to every white, women's group I'm with, and they go, oh yeah, 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 we're gonna deal with that. And then it never happens. And so it has to be intentional. Honestly, so I think that, um, and I've been, so I grew up in white spaces. I went to PWIs, my law school is white. Um, so I intentionally, after 24, made sure I was in black circles with black women. Um, and I think, so I have a lot of white friends, and I talk to them about it a lot. Um, but when I made that intentional switch, they were uncomfortable. And they told me they were uncomfortable. And that's still an ongoing conversation, and it's been five years now. Um, so I think some of it could be cultural, you know? So, like, even spaces that I wanna have fun in is different than their kind of fun. Um, things that I eat, maybe places I wanna travel. Like, it, I'm from Nigeria. My, I have five white best friends, and only one of them is coming on my birthday trip to Nigeria, because the rest are uncomfortable. <laughs> So like, I mean, and that's real. And then I'll call them out and they'll stay in their discomfort for the next six months. But like, I think, how do we bridge that gap where um, we can be comfortable in both cultures because I have to live in your culture all the time, you know? And like even my all black churches, some of them won't come. So I think 
it depends on maybe experiences and the type of people. But over majority, I think that switchover is sometimes hard. She, she wants to say something. I didn't, yeah. didn't want to. I just, um, I guess I'm hearing a lot about black and white and black and white. Mm -hmm. And my point, the point I would like to make is it is not black and white. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more nuance in it. I mean, I remember when Jackie told me that when my grandparents immigrated to America, they were not white. They were Jewish. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. not, you know. Well, you know, Jews were not white when they came to the United States. Italians were not white. They became white. Mm -hmm. Ethnic groups were not white. Mm -hmm. There's white culture, but there's a lot of different variances on it, and I'm sure there's not a monolithic black culture. And there's intersectionality. You know, you can't talk about someone's white, but someone's evangelical, or someone's Jewish. I mean, I think part of building a relationship is recognizing that it's, we have to be sensitive to the nuances on both sides. Otherwise, it seems to me we're emphasizing the position where we're squaring off against each other rather than trying to build bridges. Can I, can I push back on that a little bit? Sorry, um, <laughs> yeah. I, uh, so one of the things that's interesting, I am Irish, so technically when my, my ancestors came here, we weren't considered white. But the big difference between being white or white passing is that we can, we can fit it. Uh, we don't have something that that just like automatically identifies us as Sorry, other. Do I know? <laughs> but, but you know what? I get I get mistaken for Jewish a lot too. So who knows? Uh, so I think like what's important when we talk about like black and white and black and white, and all that these ladies uh, respond to is that when you think about like the people who came and who assimilated, it's way easier for someone from Europe to assimilate and become white. Like whiteness is a concept, but like when I'm walking down the street, unless I say something, no one's going to assume that I'm other. No, but so, someone could, people have yelled at me and then she yeah, so, okay. oh, my, my, I guess my, it's, it's, not, it's a response to both of the questions around it happening and also um, this issue around the nuances of black and white. So if we just think about systems, it, it, like take color out, right? Think about systems. And the system that African Americans have been um, basically ostracized from since landing in American soil, right? If white women groups do not reconcile with that first, we would never be able to have a real conversation and work together. I mean, it's a reconciliation that you have to say Irish, Italian, whatever your ethnic group is. Systematically, this group of people have been pushed in every single era of the world that we know. That's really, that's a lot of pain for us. It's generational that has went from folks who were on plantations that still is inside of me today. And, and it, I think if we can reconcile with that, first, forget the issues. Because we, we're talking about a system, right? It's not issues anymore. This is a system that until you reconcile that the system has been in your favor, yeah. always, always, yeah. always. <laughs> at, we deal with it at work, our jobs that we can lose. We deal with it at home. We deal with it at school, at PWIs. We, we, we deal with it in Chicago. And so we have to, we are, we are carrying that. That's our bag. And we cannot say, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be black today. So we have to navigate through this system. And until we come to reconcile with that, I think it will always be a separation of these movements. But I think conversations about shared interests, and reconciling and understanding that, it's all about understanding first and relationships. So I'm gonna make what you like to add to the conversation. I just have to say that my color is self-evident. 
There is nowhere I can go and anyone can say, oh, she's not black. Mm -hmm. I worked in the civil rights movement. I went to high school with Jews and Japanese, because I went to Hyde Park a long time ago. But in the civil rights movement, there were people after the 70s who were Jewish, who decided they didn't want to deal with the civil rights movement anymore. So they just moved into the white world and acted just like nothing ever happened and nobody ever noticed. I remained friends with some of them because there were certain things you went through in the civil rights movement that you just shared and you just mm -hmm. never forgot. Mm -hmm. You know, the Sherney, uh, Sherney Goodman and Cheney event was something that went on during the time I was in the movement. Mm -hmm. But I say that to say that if you're Jewish, and I understand that there are people who resent it, there are lots of white people who resent it. I mean, I worked with a, I just got who said all Jewish people were responsible for the death of Jesus Christ, which I thought was the most stupid thing I'd ever heard. <laughs> but that's what he thought. But the thing of it is, unless you're really looking when you're walking down the street, you don't know Jewish from Irish, from Italian, but you always know black. Always, always, always. Okay. So I want to add um, like an example. Um, so I think what we're getting mixed up here is that we want to be relational with each other. We want to build with each other, but the system is not relational. The system itself that is like pervasive when you walk outside. So an example of this is I'm in law school and like I said, most of my friends in law school are white. And if I'm being honest, so I'm Nigerian, so I don't have ties to the African-American slavery history. And my white friend is the one with the record, the one who lived in the poverty line, job to job. And we're both in law school, right? But I, I've never been to jail. I don't, we have different stories, right? But still people treated her better than me. People thought I was the one that would have the record. People thought I was the one that didn't have parents, who had parents who had a broken home, but it was her. But people, you can't, the system can't tell face value because the system doesn't try to get to know us and our stories. Because me and her have talked, we know each other's stories, but it doesn't change how the system treats us and sees us. So I went to predominantly white schools as well, uh, but I was fortunate enough to always live in a black community. So I always felt that I had the best of both worlds to some degree. Uh, so in talking to my white girlfriends, oftentimes I'll tell them a story. And you know, so-and-so, so-and-so happened. And they'll go, and I'm telling them about something adverse that happened to me, and they'll go, well, it happens to women. And I'll say, yeah, and so-and-so, so-and-so happened to me. Well, it happened to women. And, and, and I'm like, okay, wait a minute. <laughs> Look at me. <laughs> I'm black and I'm a woman. <laughs> I'm not talking about this happened to me because I'm black. In fact, I wasn't even thinking about that at the time. I was talking about it happened to me, but it happened to me because I'm black and a woman not because I'm either or. And so that just shows you that when you're talking, having an ordinary conversation, they're looking at me as black only. They're not looking at me as a woman. And that, happens, that has happened my entire life, that I've had to tell my white girlfriends who I'm with every day, who I have a relationship with, who I talk like this all the time because I don't pull any punches. Because if you like me, you like me. If you don't, you don't. So that's the, this is who I am. And I still have to correct them because they're seeing me as black. raised in Chicago and um, and I come from a first generation immigrant family and uh, and my whole world was that family and and that and the only reason I'm saying that is that I never really had an experience of having a personal relationship with a person of color I mean I mean I had some with non Greeks but I hardly had any with people of color until I got involved in the trade union movement and that was a place for all its problems in which you, you were in a place together that you could develop 
and have conversations and have relational experiences. And what I'm thinking about as we're talking here is it's always going back to the first point of of someone who said, can we have more of these, a place to have more of these discussions, that given how Chicago is organized and everything, there are places to have those conversations that aren't, you're already in a transitional relationship when you get into those. I mean, there's still difficult conversations and everything like that, but you can't really hear each other. And so I think that that's one of the things that we have, that we have to continue to strive for is to create those places, those safe places to continue to have those conversations and not be divided. I mean, I just want to say one more thing because this is a, a downer at Chicago. <laughs> so this was when, uh, and this was in the 80s, so it was a while ago. But one of my best friends um, was an African-American woman. We were both um, staff in this trade union movement. And we both were single women, and we both had um, really close relationships with our friends' children. They were like our, I think that they were, you know, to me, they were like my godchildren. Um, and, and so we wanted to go to events together. And so we could go to an event together. There was no place where we could go that these kids could meet or we'd have time to go to a restaurant unless we went to a downtown restaurant. There was just no... There was no sort of place that was a place for both of us. And I think that that's still true in Chicago in a whole lot of ways. It goes back to a system of Chicago. It goes back to a system that's forced us to be segregated, yep. right? You know, it, you're right. It's no live experiences normally with young people of different ethnic groups in Chicago because our system is not designed that way here. Mm -hmm. And so you always have to figure out ways to navigate through it and connect and have those relationships. Yes. Oh, I just wanted to make a comment. When I came to Chicago from Mississippi over 50 years ago, I was working in Inglewood at a church with a Reverend Porter when I say ordinary, yes. yeah. yeah. I just on the weekends, on weekends at that church teaching black history or women's history. I just think that that's another way of getting some history talk out here that's much needed. The schools, I guess, can't do it all. Families can't do it all. So the churches, although they got a big job already, maybe they can find a way to teach some of this on weekends. Yeah. So I've been going back to the original question: Where does it work? How could it work to, to come together? And I'm an optimist. I'm always looking for the the best possible outcome. And I think that one place uh, that we can look uh, that's worked, and I'm talking about Chicago, and that's the uh, Chicago uh, Women's March. Um, not, and, that, and we're talking Chicago. The national one has its problems, but in Chicago, everybody came together and and worked. And I'm going all the way back to right after the 2016 election. I remember I was going to some protests and um, this friend of mine said, why are you doing that? You should be marching against corporate greed. And then another guy would say, why are you doing that? You should be marching against this. And I'm like, hey, I'll be your foot soldier, you be my foot soldier. And it was just frustrating to me that everybody had their issue. Everybody has their own grievance. But if we could come together, and the only place I saw that was that first women's march where everybody had their own issue up on a sign. It was like, oh my God, it was just like such a bit of fresh air that we could all, because I'm for all those same progressive things, but right now I'm working on this, you know? Um, or right now I'm working on that. And it doesn't deny the importance of anyone's issue or anyone's grievance when I'm working on this one. I'm still there and I'm still willing to be a foot soldier. And I found that the place I felt most capable of doing that were the coalition meetings at the women's, for the Chicago Women's March. So I'm just looking for one place that I, I felt, and you know, other things that we do. So trying to be positive. <laughs> Don't you agree? Yes. I'm Lonnie Dunaste, and I was born and raised in Ronfield. 
Um, I think some of the things that we are missing in the black and white issue, there are 77 communities in Chicago, and we have a lot of different ethnic groups. So I just got my degree in historic preservation. And so with that, all we did for two years was study the 77 communities in Chicago, and the histories, and the stories, and the structures, and the districts, and the landmarks. And I think it is important to acknowledge the person that said, we weren't white at one point. And you know, I'm trying to hide, so don't <laughs> I just want to say, I respect that because, I mean, I studied for two years and I didn't come across that until I went to a lecture a month ago with Dr. Reed, he spoke about it. He's a professor at Roosevelt University. But I think it's important that we know the story of each culture. If not, study all of that because a lot of people don't have time. There's no way to get around it. We have 77 communities. We need to understand that. We need to be sensitive to each other's story. Yes, as a black woman, I do have a story and I do want to be heard. But everybody's story needs to be heard. Everybody needs to be acknowledged. Just like the GPS, just like emotion. There's no way we are going to move forward. At some point in time, we have to deal with that. And we have to deal with the classes, you know, the different classes in order to move on. And also not forget our story, but it's important that we do that. A suggestion on how we can continue to meet, I think, I'm not a professor and a professional on this, <laughs> but I'm a part of this group called Bronze Moms Group. And I think that what we do is we walk in those different 77 communities and try to cover those bases, at least try to cover at least six to seven communities. And we have a representative in each community and we communicate and we talk about our problems and we compare and we learn the strength and weaknesses and we figure out how we can move beyond this because when you look around the world and you look at our history we were a big change in it but i do not want to eliminate the men as well or the children we have to look at all levels of this the children the men the women the boys the girls and the culture and at some point have 77 representatives in chicago where we can meet monthly and figure out what is our common thread and move forward from there. Just like we do in a relationship, because no matter how long you've been in a relationship, myself, I've been in a marriage for 30 years, I know that there's a common thread. You don't have everything in common to help you move forward. What is our goal? We want to move forward. We don't want Chicago to move forward. We want the world to move forward, but we can start in Chicago with the 77 communities and meet on a regular basis. If not here, find a place where we can just share our common threads, walk through each community once a month, and then we share our notes and figure out where we want to go from there. That's just my take on it. Thank you. I don't know if this is going to come out. Oh, I'm sorry. Joan was, OK. I really agree with this. A woman here, and working on this history project, I'm Joan Morris, and I'm one of the collaborators. And I've been with the organization. I do want to say that our group, we don't just deal with women's issues; we deal with social justice issues. My husband is one of the minority men in the organization. <laughs> we have all sorts of races and cultures within our organization, so we deal with social justice, women's issues, labor issues, all sorts of stuff. And we meet on a monthly basis. So we know each other's stories. And it's our, you know, it's our mission, as Jackie says, to capture people's stories. And we, we not only put the minds on one of the playwrights, we put it on their words. We don't censor people. And I think that's very important. It's also important to know that Reverend Eddie Wyatt, who, uh, Marcia McWilliams talked about. We had done her story. We interviewed her, and we have her story on our website. She was one of the co-founders of the National Organization of Women. We're not just we're not just uh, 
groups that are white women. So it's important to know that there's multiracial, multicultural groups that deal with social justice issues. And I, I do think that we, um, my sisters and brother here, <laughs> in my outfit, uh, you know, we deal with all these issues and we talk. We go out to each other's homes. We, you know, we know each other. And I think that's really important. Come join us. <laughs> so, National Organization of Women, Working Women's History. There's lots of organizations that are not white women groups. And that's what I want to say. Yeah, first of all, I'm so glad Joan spoke before I get to the <laughs> She really did say that we've been telling stories for a long time. What we initially started to do was to talk about women in the labor movement. And the labor movement does bring people together right. of different groups, Races. different stripes, and so on. We then enlarged. We used to be called Women in Labor History Project. And you had to be very careful how you said it. You said <laughs> women in labor. You didn't <laughs> And when we became a 501c3, we said Working Women's History Project because fewer women in unions, fewer people in unions, and so on. So we then started interviewing, as Joan said, and she interviewed Annie Wyatt, and others of us transcribed it, and Alma wrote a play, and Alma started it. You know? And we've done other plays. You've been to one of our discussions. Um, but we also said we wanted to, at some point, we wanted to talk not just about women who were movers and shakers, but <coughs> women, ordinary women. And we chose, it's not gone that far, but childcare. We chose childcare because every working woman needs childcare. And most childcare people are female, they are under, underpaid, under respected, everything. However, the, the genesis for this event was partially, in my mind, this discussion. Yeah. I knew this would right. happen. <laughs> and so we wanted to do it, and what Working Women does is pull together history and contemporary things. And as I listen to you all, I can see that if we come to, a, as a group, and talk about systems, we're going to be tense. Yeah. You know? <laughs> 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 if, <laughs> if we, it doesn't matter if it's true or not true, it doesn't matter. If we talk about stories and people telling their stories, it's easier. I hope everybody in this room signed in and gave us either a phone number or an email address. Because we do try to tell stories, and we will organize more things that may not be quite as big as this, but we can have circles. Uh, I, I think once a month, I mean, we do it for our meetings, and boy, we'd love for some of you to join us. We really would. And Joan said it so adequately and so emphatically. Uh, but in terms of committing to a once a month event, it's often very hard. But say we can do three things a year. Yeah. And this is an election yeah. year, as everybody knows. <laughs> oh my God. And we're all half crazy, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> so if we can organize some things and we would use your email and make some suggestions, maybe that would be a step. Thank you. So our time is coming to a close in the large group, but oh, yes. I want to end um, oh, and we have by sort of summing up something that a few people have said. And I think we certainly heard a theme of the importance of stories and also the importance of understanding and analyzing structures and power. And I think we can and really have to hold those together. We can, we can learn about each other and build with each other through stories. We can understand the history of race as a social construction and how that is a, uh, a construct that has changed over time, to your point. Um, at the same time that we understand, it's very real, lived, and life and death realities all across various spectrums and universes every day. 
We can think about the structures of power that uh, maintain things like white supremacy, that maintain patriarchy. We can think about the ways those intersect in policy, in practice, in all the different parts of our political and social worlds and hold those things and really be um, implicit and explicit about being intentional about facing them and thinking about what it takes to overthrow those systems that we know maintain these issues at the same time that we value um, and really can uh, create bonds of trust by sharing stories. So I think it's actually very important that we hold both of those together. Um, I appreciate Jackie and everyone else who came together.